Thanks so much, Irma, to you for the introduction, the warm hospitality, and to all of you for coming tonight. It is a great joy for me to be here. I love being in places where people care deeply about the church and where people love to see connections between uh, theological reflection and every area of life. And that means every area of study. And those kind of connections are uh, so rich and deep in forming our growth as Christian believers. And it is a joy to have the opportunity to reflect on some of those connections uh, with you, both tonight uh, and also in tomorrow's lectures. The handout includes a outline of tonight's lecture on page one as well as some other materials that I will refer to um, along the way. And so if you could have that handout ready and be ready for a little nimble page flipping along the way, we'll be good to go. The theme for these lectures emerges very much for me out of a place of difficulty and pain especially with the way that churches across, especially the Protestant spectrum, have been responding to the news. On any given Sunday morning, we do wake up uh, to a world filled with terrible news headlines. In the 30 or so weeks that I've been working and praying about these lectures, the Sunday morning news has been filled with uh, headlines related to hunger and systemic poverty, global public health epidemics, human trafficking, climate change, refugee displacement, political corruption, religious persecution, structural racism, moral injury, gun violence, mass incarceration, sexual violence, fraud, predatory lending, warfare, medical malpractice, demeaning behavior toward persons with mental health challenges and disabilities, bullying on school playgrounds, pornography, inherited family trauma, false imprisonment, domestic violence, clergy misconduct, anti-Semitism, drunk driving, environmental degradation, genocide, persecution of sexual minorities, and suicide. It is a tidal wave of horrors. And it confronts us with unrelenting, rapid fire intensity, especially for those of us who are active in social media, which, despite the many beautiful positive aspects of social media, often brings us these terrible headlines in such a way as it gives us a lot of practice at merely skimming these headlines merely skimming information about all of this devastatingly bad news. Truly, we live in a world in which we are in over our heads. And as we begin these lectures, I want to also acknowledge that one or more of these traumas becomes, for so many of us, deeply personal, with the Sunday morning news only stoking the embers of a nightmare that has kept us up in the watches of the night. While preparing these lectures, I attended a funeral for a tragic victim of suicide, something that I know has touched this community so recently also. And at that service, the preacher reminded us of a potent line often attributed to Philo. Be kind, he wrote, for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. And so as we begin tonight with as much gentleness as I can convey, I do want to acknowledge that lectures on a topic like this may well resonate with each of us in such different ways, and especially for those of us who struggle personally, perhaps privately, with the effects of one kind of trauma or violence in our own lives. I pray that God's healing presence will be with us all. All of this becomes especially poignant when we go to church. So here we are on Sunday morning, the recipient of these bad news headlines, and we go to church, these places of warmth and encouragement where there will be greetings, songs, Bible readings, sermons, announcements about the next, next church potluck. And in the question of all of these activities, <clears throat> 
the question is, what do we do with all of this violence, injustice, and trauma as we gather for weekly worship? Now, there are at least three reasons why I feel compelled tonight to reflect on the connection between all of these bad news headlines and the ordinary practices of Christian worship. The it comes every week Sunday morning worship service that every pastor and church musician needs to prepare for. First, because this topic is relatively undeveloped, while there is a good deal of reflection in Christian communities of all kinds, and especially, I think, in the Anabaptist tradition, about how we can mobilize response efforts to violence and trauma, become advocates for justice and peace, and also how we can organize extraordinary liturgies or public events, times for remembrance or for prayer, prayer vigils. There are relatively few reflections on what all of these bad news headlines mean for our ordinary practices. And second, I choose the, this topic because ordinary Sunday worship is, I am absolutely convinced, a most extraordinary occasion in and of itself. A place in which God's spirit is at work comforting the hurting, pricking consciences of the faithful, forming the faith of all of us as God's dearly loved children. Ordinary worship services matter a great deal, even when that work of the Holy Spirit seems very imperceptible to us in our fatigue or boredom or mind-wandering uh, lack of capacity for engagement. A friend of mine, Matthew Kamick, has written a brilliant new book on how the Christian community can extend hospitality to our Muslim neighbors. And in this book, he reflects on the experiences of terrorism and the way that it often shapes Christian imagination. And he has a chapter in this book on the formative power of worship, much along the lines that Irma um, introduced uh, at the beginning of this evening. And in that book, he makes this beautiful statement that really is so compelling in saying, when it comes to tragedies of terror, what may matter even more than the three songs we sing after that event are the 3,000 songs we have sung before it the songs which have sculpted our soul, the Bible reading practices and preaching practices and prayer practices that have formed our orientation to the world that God so dearly loves. For what we do on normal Sundays normalizes our response to the world's trauma, confirming and reinforcing the church's basic stance toward the world expressing our fundamental convictions about how God is active in creation and culture, in institutions and in our personal lives. Our children and the world out there watches to see how what we do in church or what we fail to do in church responds to all of these bad headlines. Now I want to just point out that the suggestions I'll be making over these three lectures are indeed very ordinary. They have to do with ordinary practices that can be repeated and sustained over time. And the things that I'll be talking about are in one way insufficient responses to the world's traumas. Oh, how we need to mobilize action. We need advocacy and study and reflection, and we need the prophetic word to be spoken day in and day out. But we also need thoughtful, pastoral, realistic, and sustainable, ordinary practices, week in and week out, that will build for us the muscles of hope and lament and solidarity and empathy that we need for our lives in this world. Those of us in the USA experience this in a particular poignant urgency, even in these past few weeks. Though I selected this topic months ago, it's been amazing to me how in the past three Sundays, 
it has been particularly poignant, especially in the United States given the context of the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings. Following those hearings, my social media accounts lit up on Saturday afternoons with debates about how and whether churches would speak any direct word about those events unfolding in Washington. Would there be a word of encouragement and comfort to those who have experienced sexual assault and trauma? Those Saturday afternoon active Facebook discussions, and do realize that many of my friends are worship leaders and pastors trying to work out their salvation in fear and trembling on Facebook on Saturday, <laughs> were followed then on Sunday by reflections, often from lay Christians reflecting and sometimes being critical of how their church engaged or did not engage in those culturally sensitive topics. Painfully, in far too many churches, at least in the United States, and for sure outside the Anabaptist tradition, there is barely a mention of many of the horrors that I have described. Far too many churches in the United States never once prayed out loud about racist events that we experienced in Ferguson and Charleston and Charlottesville. And far too many churches have never directly spoken about injustice to indigenous peoples do not practice lament as a regular dimension of life together, and only rarely have prayed for the plight of persecuted people or refugees or for the enemies of flourishing humanity, including sexual predators, racists, and predatory lenders. And thus, our modern prophets of social justice are so often compelled to lament the church is so silent about, and then fill in the blank. And any one of those horrors that I've mentioned could easily uh, be listed. In the New Testament parable of the Good Samaritan, it was the priest and then a Levite, the leaders of the people's liturgy who passed by on the other side. Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan specifically critiques priestly, liturgical disengagement. And while that parable surely impresses on us the need for action as a primary response, it also, it seems, implicates our liturgies, our priestly way of being in the world. And it critiques especially those ways that we rehearse disengagement and indifference. How tragic if our ordinary worship practices, week in and week out, become a prime site for disengagement rather than a deeply integrated part of a priestly response to the world's pain. Surely the church is calling us. Surely the gospel of Jesus is calling us to something deeper. Now, a full answer to how the church could respond could surely occupy an entire course here at CMU, because every single element of worship has a role to play. Bible reading, preaching, singing, praying, baptism, Lord's Supper, testimonies, visual art, and more. The field of worship studies is rich and deep with so many different things to explore. But for tonight, I would like to start modestly in a place that is perhaps the obvious place to begin, but one that is filled with so much uh, often unrealized potential, and that is the practice of public intercessory prayer, the prayers of the people, pastoral prayer, the intercessions that we speak as uh, congregations in a week, out, went week in, week out basis over time. And my invitation is for us to think about these uh, intercessory prayers as a prime focal site for pastoral congregational leadership. A, you see it on the handout written out, a super concentrated expression of a congregation's stance toward the world, a super concentrated expression of a congregation's grasp of its calling to be the royal priesthood of all creation in Jesus' name, a super concentrated expression of a congregation's conviction about the scope and nature of God's redemptive uh, activity sharpened through our study of what the Bible says salvation soteriology is all about, 
pneumatology, the work of the Holy Spirit, broad and far and wide in creation and even, as we heard in Romans 8, in our prayers, in pastoral care, prophetic witness, and missional engagement, even when they are relatively brief, even when they are no more than five minutes long, public intercessory prayer can be a super concentrated expression of the church's response to the world's pain and to the scope of God's redemptive activity in the world. So let's reflect on that together and let's set the tone for it by doing just a little bit of singing. So if you would turn in the back of your handout, I believe it's page uh, 10, you will see a beautiful, haunting Portuguese intercessory prayer that was actually written and has often been sung uh, at, uh, as congregations uh, prepare for public prayer. For the troubles of the world, and now I'm looking here. Yes, page 10. Let's sing the English of this together plaintively, imagining that this music is setting the tone for our public intercessions on a given Sunday. Great longing, music of great hope, ending with Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison. In the long and varied history of the church's pastoral prayers, prayers of the people, intercessory prayers, there are great treasures of wisdom to uncover. Please turn with me in your handout to page, I believe it's page five. Actually, page four, I'm sorry. Back on page four of your handout is one of the first extensive prayers we have recorded. Clement of Rome, about 96 AD, a remarkable prayer of praise and intercession. The bold texts are intercessions. The texts that are not bold are praise acclamations that we'll uh, look back at again tomorrow. And immediately you can see in Clement's writing in that first bold-faced paragraph on the left-hand side, an impulse that I would like to explore. I'm calling it the 360 degree impulse. The impulse to even in a relatively brief prayer to survey the whole range of need in a Christian community and culture. He does it in these very simple and pithy phrases. We ask you, Master, to be our helper and protector. Save those among us who are in distress. Have mercy on the humble, raise up the fallen, show yourself to those in need, heal the sick, turn back on those uh, of your people who wander, feed the hungry, ransom prisoners, rake up, raise up the weak, comfort the discouraged. It all moves so very quickly, doesn't it? From one short phrase to the other. But you can feel in that short paragraph the seed of what would become the regular practice of the church to pray for a wide variety of needs on any given week. In order to 
do a super compressed version of history, I'm going to invite you to turn the page and skip about 300 years. And that little germ of a seed is planted and comes to fruition in this late 4th century document, the Apostolic Constitutions. This is a uh, record of the public prayers of intercession that would have occurred in a Lord's Supper liturgy. And what immediately strikes us is just how long a text it is. 18 different paragraphs with intercessions. It is a 360 degree prayer of a kind. And after each one of these petitions, the congregation would have responded, Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison. And you can feel the intercessor moving through different groups of people from within the church. We pray for the peace and tranquility of the world, that first, or really second paragraph, and of the holy churches. And then if you just let your eye move down, we pray for the holy Catholic and apostolic church of God, the holy parish in this place, for every episcopate which is under heaven, for bishops by name, for presbyters, the elders of the church, for the diaconate, the deacons in the church. Uh, in the right-hand side, for those who bear fruit in the holy of the church, uh, for the holy church, and those who give alms to the needy, for those who bring offerings and first fruits, for our brethren, uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, newly enlightened, we pray, those who have just been baptized, for those afflicted by illness, and then what is arguably the very first Mennonite prayer of all, the line, we pray for our enemies and for those who hate us. It is a beautiful act, actually, of obedience to scriptural command. And you see in this prayer a deep desire to um, obey those very um, clear words of scripture uh, from uh, Jesus' words from the cross, inviting us to pray for our enemies. This is one of perhaps a dozen examples of 360-degree prayers of the early church. They are long. They include a great deal of detail. And they did not survive, largely. The story of these fourth century prayers is largely one of falling away. They were simply too long to be sustained. They actually came back in the Reformation period as Luther and Calvin and others brought back a long, comprehensive prayer as part of their liturgies. And they've actually been restored in the later part of the 20th century by Vatican II among Catholic communities, by um, a variety of Protestant traditions, worship books published by the United Church of Christ, United Church of Canada, United Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, trying to recover this practice of 360 degree praying. And in the back of your hymnals at number 720, you will find a beautiful example of this 360 degree prayer at least in outline form, captured uh, there at number uh, 720. It is a prayer that prays for Christians everywhere, for the nations of the world, for those overcome by violence, those who endure trials. It, it is a way of comprehensively organizing the church's intercessions. And number 720, if we were to actually trace its history, I'm pretty sure we could trace the lines of influence back, at least indirectly, if not directly, to that text that you see in the apostolic constitutions of the fourth century. At its best, this 360 degree pattern of prayer is inspired by Jesus' commands for prayer, pray for your enemies, pray that God would send laborers to the vineyard, and the Lord's prayer with his petition, your kingdom come. It is a vision inspired by Paul's writing that the church is a royal priesthood of all creation. It is inspired by Paul's instructions, especially those instructions to Timothy. First Timothy, I urge that petitions, prayers, and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people. And it's inspired, this pattern of praying, by awareness that these prayers are a participation in the prayers of the Spirit. Romans 8, which we heard at the beginning tonight. That is the spirit who is at work in our hearts, prompting us to pray, Abba, Father, and helping us to pray in our weakness when we do not know what to pray. The big idea is for us to stretch our public prayer to include far more than what is on the hearts of any of us as individual people, 
to stretch what we name in public prayer to map onto the full scope of divine activity and the full range of what redemption can look like. For what we pray in public, and here's the line, students, if you want to write down a line, this is the one to write down, all right? And this is the one to talk about with your teachers tomorrow in class. For what we pray for in public is a remarkably reliable barometer of what we believe about the scope and nature of God's activity in the world. What we pray for in public is a reliable barometer or measure of what we believe God's scope and activity is in the world, which is why I become so troubled if there are not prayers about human trafficking and sexual assault and the deep injustices with indigenous peoples and displaced refugees, if these things flood the news that comes into our social media accounts and we are not practiced at praying about them, we rehearse our disinterest and we actually convey unwittingly the sense that the gospel has nothing to say about them and that God's activity does not extend to them. When of course we know as convicted Christian believers that it does, that it matters for every square inch of the world that God made and God loves. Please turn in your handout page seven. On page seven, you will see a slightly, for tonight's purposes, elongated, or slightly elongated version of a comprehensive 360 degree prayer. You will see that at the beginning of every paragraph is a line that names the topic. It is a prayer that is located in my own city, the city of Grand Rapids. A prayer leader on Sunday who prays extemporaneously without writing down a prayer ahead of time might actually come to the front of the congregation with simply those categories listed without the details all written in. I've given you the full text here. But committing every single week to a prayer for creation, for the nations of the world, for the city in which we live, and then you will see a cluster of four in this case. In one week it might be a single, in another week it might be two but areas of cultural trauma, violence, and injustice that specially need our attention. And then prayers for the churches of the world, for our own congregation, and for those with particular needs. Committing to a discipline of moving through that list is like a jazz musician who commits to the discipline of playing the chord pattern that undergirds all jazz music and then allowing for improvisation that responds to the needs and hopes and fears that come to us in our social media accounts on any given Sunday. In my own congregation, on the Sunday following those Brett Kavanaugh uh, hearings and all of the cultural trauma related to sexual assault, I was so deeply blessed when a member of my own church uh, got up to lead public intercessory prayer and said these words. Lord our God, bless those who suffer silently and in shame for injuries inflicted on them, for those who are bullied, assaulted, rejected, and vilified, and fall into self-loathing. And we pray for all of those who have inflicted these injuries. Bring truth out of confusion and clarity out of distortion and purify the intentions of those entrusted to discern the truth. Guide and strengthen their families and those of us they rely on for support. Lead us all to a restorative justice and renewed humanity. And may your spirit be at work to use these recent events and the courage of those who share their experiences to raise awareness of and compassion for victims and perpetrators of abuse of all kinds including the reckless use of social media to stir resentments and compound offenses. Lord our God, help us not to react impulsively or tribally to these events, but by your Spirit's power may we listen and then thoughtfully and prayerfully respond with words and deeds of empathy, healing, and reconciliation. By your grace, may we become a culture of grace. <laughs>
I recall being uh, deeply moved um, as that service unfolded. And then what was so striking to me is later that evening, another member of my own congregation, grateful for these words, contacted the person who prayed them and asked for permission to post them on social media. And they became shared through social media, the redemptive use of social media, a sign that they had spoken in a profound way, all because the jazz-like chord patterns were put in place, all because of the normal practice on every ordinary Sunday that we would pray for the world that God so loves, the nations of the world, for at least one area of cultural trauma in, uh, specifically, as well as for the needs of congregations. It is so often the patterns of worship that we choose that become the most significant thing that forms us over time. They are like the chords that sustain jazz music. They signal what is important to us and they create the space for our responsive improvisation. There is something so beautiful about having a, and whether it's exactly like this or something similar, there's plenty of room for um, variance here, but of having something like this disciplined chord pattern uh, to, uh, to work with. Some virtues. Virtue number one. It allows for breadth, breadth of concern. Every single week there are prayers for the healing of creation as well as for the health concerns of individuals in the congregation. And there's also room for specificity. In the long history of intercessory prayer, what often happened with that fourth century set of intercessions that I introduced, if you were to trace it through the history of worship, is that they became what, what are called in some liturgical traditions the general intercessions. In order to pray about everything really briefly, the specificity is lost. And there isn't room to move into the kind of prayer about those sexual assault uh, 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 hearings that happened that I just described. But in the jazz-like improvisation, with a form and pattern to guide us, and with a pastoral sensibility as we extemporaneously pray our way through it, the possibilities are rich indeed. It is also then a pattern in the jazz-like way that it can be brought to life that values both a sincerity in prayer as well as the formative power of prayer. In the field of worship studies, this is perhaps one of the central concerns. Should all prayer be extemporaneous? Or is there value in set forms or liturgies? I tend to come from a tradition which lives by the old adage, a red prayer is a dead prayer. That's the formative nature of the tradition I'm a part of. Perhaps some of you are in that context too. But there are alternatives besides every prayer being read and every prayer being freshly extemporized, which often does result in the very same thing being said over and over again, does it not? Yeah. There is something beautiful about that middle way in which as prayer leaders we commit to a regular chord pattern, a regular discipline that we pray through, but which we bring to life in an extemporaneous way, formed by our prayers all week long. And in the case of that prayer I just mentioned, the thoughtfulness to put our pens to paper to be as sensitive and thoughtful as possible around topics that are sensitive and challenging. So there's genius, there's wisdom that comes in the form of this prayer itself. But there are also beautiful ways that we can inhabit this prayer. And for the sake of time, I'll focus on just two tonight, themes that will come back tomorrow. One of them is the practice of being more disciplined and more intentional than we often are in voicing prayers that are fragmentary that are halting, that actually say before God's face, we do not know how to pray when we do not know how to pray. 
One of the gifts that we can give our children is the freedom, the permission to be speechless and, if not speechless, to be halting in prayer. You will see on page 8 the conclusion of this form of prayer, just a gesture in that direction, a prayer for those we name now in our hearts, for concerns which we dare not speak out loud, for concerns we are not able to bring to full expression, for all of us who feel unable to pray, knowing that your spirit teaches us to pray as we ought. When it comes to violence, injustice, and trauma, that text from Romans 8 needs to be so central in our imagination, especially for the way that trauma can rob us of the capacity to put words together, the way that trauma can rob us of the capacity to be emotionally attuned, to have the freedom when trauma comes our way, the freedom to experience fragmentary prayer as grace, knowing it is the spirit who works through it. Churches that routinely, in ordinary Sundays, normalize this way of praying, at least in a portion of the prayer, set in motion a pattern that can be built upon by pastoral counselors and caregivers and all of us who experience trauma. The fragmentary prayer turn. A second thing that can be so powerful and beautiful as we inhabit patterns like this, and we'll say more about this tomorrow, is to really push these prayers in our own language toward our ultimate eschatological hope. You know, at funerals, for those who have committed suicide, and at the door of Holocaust museums, we often linger in aching silence and then finding ourselves searching for the deepest hope of eschatological, deepest vein of eschatological hope we can find. Not just the hope for the sun to come out tomorrow, but for the hope that the fullness of God's kingdom will come, that pain and sorrow will flee away, that the ultimate trauma and pain of our universe, so vast, so pervasive, coming at us every single week with that unrelenting force, um, will one day be, uh, will one day end, will, and that the goodness of God's kingdom will come in all its fullness. We need practice at reciting the all the way down promise that there is nothing in all creation that will separate us from the love of God. And we need to learn to pray, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. You can see just a little gesture of this at the end of prayer, uh, that prayer there, top of page 8. All this we pray in the strong name of Jesus. The one who redeems all creation invites us to the feast. The one who identifies with us in our weaknesses and promises never to leave or forsake us. The one who lives and reigns with you in the spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen rehearsing and a week in, week out basis. Prayers that are fragmentary, as well as the all the way down kind of eschatological hope prayer. Now on page seven and eight there, I give you just one model. And the first reaction that you will no doubt have is that would never work in our church. Perhaps it's too long. Perhaps the wording isn't quite right. It doesn't feel just right at home. I don't share that model tonight to say it's a one-size-fits-all model. What I actually am wanting to share with you is the central DNA behind it, the vision of this 360-degree mode of praying that aims to be both broad as well as specific, that aims to be very sensitive to places of cultural trauma and to do so on a week-in, week-out basis. In our work at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, we have met some wonderful pastoral leaders along the way who've actually showed us very different ways of doing the very same kind of thing, but in very different cultural contexts. These are compassionate pastors who bring a compassionate pastoral imagination to their work. So let me describe just a few of them, and you'll see it's a very uh, big difference from uh, the model that you see before you. One was a pastor who um, 
had a tradition in a small gathering of gathering joys of concerns that would be made part of an accessory prayer. Community of about 30 people that would routinely gather. But it was a pastor who noticed that over time, the joys and concerns that were named were almost always health concerns of individuals in the congregation or particular congregation events that were coming up or uh, perhaps needs in the individual families represented, all absolutely beautiful things. And this pastor, in a beautiful and winsome way, had the challenge of stretching the prayer life of that community to encompass this 360 degree vision. You will see the questions that uh, he, in this case, asked on page eight. Questions that can shape the gathering of prayer requests, the shaping of joys and concerns. Questions that can break open and expand the kind of things that me many people would bring up on their own. For which divine actions shall we bless God? For what country or part of the world shall we pray? For what concerns in our town or city, not just the families represented here, shall we pray? For which voiceless and powerless person shall we pray? Take those questions to a group of high school kids in your church and really work at them together. And just their experience can be involved in stretching a congregation's prayer vocabulary in beautiful ways. Another pastor worked in a suburban megachurch a uh, kind of church where there was extensive use of, of multimedia presentation. The service began with five or six contemporary songs. It was followed by announcements for congregational ministry and then usually an extensive sermon. And this thoughtful pastor said, we need to restore public intercessory prayer in a significant way, in a contextual way. And here's how it went. On Saturday mornings in this suburban community, a group of about four people would gather and they would plan Sunday morning's prayer. They would bring with them newspapers uh, to decide together, to discern together what would be prayed about. They had the discipline every week of choosing three headlines about international news, three headlines about local city news, and three headlines about congregational news. They got the media team involved and would project those headlines on the screen. Three international three local, and three within the congregation every single week. They accepted the discipline of a 360-degree prayer. The people involved in that Saturday morning prayer group testified that after being in that prayer group for a few weeks, they never read the newspaper the same way again. Their reading of the newspaper became for them an act of intercessory prayer. It was as if every time they saw a story in the evening news, they responded, Lord in, your Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It changed the way they perceived the news and it changed the way that congregation signaled its stance toward the world. Nothing was written out, it was powerfully contextual, but the same idea was at work. The possibilities are endless if we become grasped by the key DNA in which we are working. For tonight, I'd like to uh, conclude by reading a poem. It is a poem by an English poet by the name of Malcolm Geit. You will see it there on page eight. Mr. Geit is a extensively published poet in England. He's written remarkable Christian reflections. And just last week posted on his um, own website, um, the powerful poetry that you see there on the bottom of page eight. It actually gets right to the theme of what I'm addressing in these lectures. I immediately wrote him and he granted permission for these poems to be printed tonight and for me to share them with you. This poem, The Six Days World Transposing in an Hour, sums up beautifully and compellingly what I felt compelled to share tonight. 24-7 in the six days world, in endless cycles of unnerving news, relentlessly our restless hurts are hurled through empty cyberspace. 
Is there no muse to make of all that pain an elegy? Or in those waves of white noise to discern Christ's inner cantus firmus? That deep tone that might give rise at last to harmony. We may not seal it off or drown it out, nor close our hearts down in the hour of prayer. But listening through dissonance and doubt, wait in the space between until we hear a change of key, a secret chord disclosed, a kind of tune, and all the world transposed. Thank you very much. <laughs>